Go ahead, come in. Hi, nice to see you again. Now, I'm going to do come in. One thing about having, I'll just to pick up these glasses. One thing about having um, had to rearrange all the books in the new study and double shelf them, and there are two things. One is I can't find what I'm looking for, which is always a problem. But the other good thing, of course, is that I can find what I'm not looking for. And I suddenly <coughs> stumble across a book I haven't seen for a while. So that just happened recently. If you come along here, you know, insofar as there's, I mean, there's a lot of Father Brown and G.K. Or GK Chesterton and Balak, and then suddenly it goes into my Chinese things, and then it's 16th century lyrics. But I was sort of intrigued because I saw here, you see this, you can see immediately by looking at this, that this is vellum. It's, uh, it's not at all the usual cloth or leather bindings. And um, I hadn't seen this for ages. I bought this really quite a long time ago. I mean, 30 years ago, if that, in um, David's bookshop in Cambridge. And simply because it was vellum, I thought, well, it might be very, very old. They do have some very old books there. There it is, English lyrics. And there's an interesting little, if you could, the, the, um, the press there with the two trees. It says... Um, uh, Arbor Scientia, Arbor Vita, which is you know, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Come and have a seat. In fact, this book is um, is not very old. I mean, it's not 16th century. You might have heard. it's it's late 19th century. In fact, it's uh, I think it's 1888. Let me just show you this in a little bit more detail. So English lyrics. You know, it's a book of poetry. And. Um, Look at this. Five pounds I paid for this book. Five pounds. I mean, you can scarcely get a pint of beer for five pounds now. It's obviously a gift from somebody at a Christmas in, in 1883. So, Keegan Paul Trench. Beautifully, beautifully printed. Lovely decal thing. You see the little two-colour printing there. And the titling and the, some in red, some in black. And these lovely sort of hand-cut pages of handmade paper so it's very beautiful and if you see it's a series of lyrics often love lyrics starting here with Thomas Wyatt the earliest of the Elizabethan lyricists and then it goes right on uh, up to uh, there we are look Lord Byron Percy Shelley the, the, the romantics um, Hartley Coleridge Coleridge's uh, son finishes with Thomas Lovell Beddoes so it's very comprehensive range, and it's lovely for dipping into. Anyway, I was dipping into it, because I just had randomly found it on the shelf, and I suddenly came across two very beautiful and, in fact, very famous lyrics, short lyric poems, by Sir Richard Lovelace. Um, it's written Lovelace, but pronounced Lovelace. And um, I suddenly thought it'd be good to share those with you, because you may remember last time I, I read you Andrew Marvell's poem about being in a garden. And Marvel, of course, was a poet on the Cromwellian side of the Civil War, and um, though he managed to survive it and get through, but he, you know, he worked for and with Milton. Um, but I thought, well, let's do Loveless, because Loveless was one of the uh, cavalier poets. So it was a whole category of poets, the cavaliers. I mean, they were, they were all in the court or around the court of Charles I. And they they were involved in in as soldiers as well as courtiers for him, and with, they had a very strong we would now say romantic, but romantic wasn't a word that was used in that way in those days. But they had a very strong sense of king and country, but also of the the holiness of the king and 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 the rightness of his cause. But they also had a great sense of gallantry. They seemed to channel in through themselves all the kind of virtues that Chaucer shows in his knight in the Knight's Tale, or or that Spencer, you know, um, allegorised in, in The Fairy Queen. And um, they, they're they famous for having had long flowing locks, you know, the, the, we, we always think of the uh, the civil, English Civil War between the, the Roundheads and the Royalists that we used to be told in a comic book that, um, um, Comic History of England, that, that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Cavaliers, the Royalists were wrong but romantic and the roundheads were right but repulsive. Um, I mean, we'll leave that to debate. But um, 
one of the conventions of love poetry at the time was to, and these were often, you know, really court amours. They went, they were kind of lovely, delicate, playful, almost a kind of game of a very, very light touch, gracious, you know, ritualized, unthreatening kind of flirtation, a little bit of fun. Uh, but they always disguised everybody's names with na classical names. So he writes to Lucaster or Althea. Um, anyway, lo and behold, two of the finest of his lyrics were right next to each other here. So I thought you'd like to hear them. This is a little touch of 17th century cavalier poetry. You'll see that there's a lightness of touch and a grace and yet a profundity. So um, here is to Lucaster on going to the wars. He was, he was, uh, this was actually the Scottish wars he was going off to, but, um, you know, it's part of his honour to be a delicate and good and beautiful courtly lover, but also part of his honour to be a soldier. And he now comes to a point where wanting to be his lady's good servant, but also his king's cavalier, might bring them into conflict. And it's very beautifully resolved in this little poem to Lucaster going to the wars. Tell me not, sweet, I am unkind, that from the nunnery of thy chaste breast and quiet mind to war and arms I fly. True, a new mistress now I chase, the first foe in the field, and with a stronger faith embrace a sword, a horse, a shield. Yet this inconstancy is such as you too shall adore. I could not love thee, dear, so much, loved I not honour more. Oh, it's just beautiful and must have been the feeling of many a soldier going off, you know, even down to the tragedy of the First World War, that the men knew it was an honourable thing to go and their their women folk loved them for the, and honoured them for, for, for that honour and yet it involved parting. Anyway, um, eventually, of course, the Civil War came after the Scottish Wars, the Civil War came to England and and um, the country was divided and there were still some hopes that Parliament could be persuaded to accommodate the King and the King could be persuaded to accommodate Parliament and it wouldn't have to come to blows. And um, the, he was a Kentish man, Sir Richard Lovelace, and the men of Kent, the people of Kent, voted that he should be the person to ride to Westminster and give a royalist petition asking for a royal settlement to the Parliament, who were hostile to the royalists, of course. So he, with great honour and uh, nobility, rode off and presented this petition and was immediately arrested and cast in prison, actually, in the, the, the gatehouse prison at Westminster. And um, this poem, containing, I think, is probably two of his most famous lines, is a poem about liberty from a place of incarceration. He's literally in prison when he writes this poem. It's called To Althea from Prison. And uh, it's got a brief glimpse of Althea visiting him, as it were, through the prison grates. But it's really, although it's written from prison, it is one of the supreme poems about freedom, about liberty. So To Althea from Prison. When love with unconfined wings hovers within my gates, and my divine Althea brings to whisper at the grates. When I lie tangled in her hair and fettered in her eye, the gods that wanton in the air know no such liberty. When flowing cups run swiftly round with no allaying Thames, our careless heads with roses bound, our hearts with loyal flames. When thirsty grief in wine we steep, when healths and draughts go free, fishes that tipple in the deep know no such liberty. When, like committed linnets, I with shriller throat shall sing the sweetness, mercy, majesty and glories of my king when i shall voice aloud how good he is how great should be enlarged winds that curl the flood know no such liberty stone walls do not a prison make nor iron bars a cage minds innocent and quiet take that for an hermitage if i have freedom in my love and in my soul am free. Angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. 
So wonderful, wonderful, beautifully phrased lyric celebration. And you see, in both poems, actually, you get this notion of quietness and innocence. It's a, it's a different time. It's not the poetry of uh, lust or oppression or passion. It's the poetry of really delicate, beautiful, graceful courtesy and a kind of light touch in the darkest of circumstances. Uh, it's a certain style of living that I think has always commended itself to the English mind. Anyway, uh, good to see you and uh, thanks for dropping round. <laughs>